thank you for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. And I look forward to talk with you, talking with you all about Mal here, uh, which is a place that is very near and dear to our hearts. Before we begin tonight, though, I wanted to take a minute and uh, remember Gary Brash. Anybody in this room know Gary? You know, tonight we're going to talk about some of Oregon's environmental heroes, some of our, our wilderness warriors, and Gary uh, fits into that mold. Uh, an amazing photographer, a world famous photographer, documented wild things in wild places. In, in recent years, became an incredible advocate for global climate change. He passed away a couple of days ago. He was documenting climate change at the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, it's a huge loss for huge loss for the planet. So tonight, our condolences go out to his his widow Joni, and um, just want to take a moment and remember him. And it's particularly poignant tonight because. You know, the hero of this story, one of the heroes of this story, is a wildlife photographer that made a difference, and Gary carried on that legacy and was incredibly worthy of it. So uh, here's to Gary. So tonight, uh, we're going to talk about Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, past, present, and future. And I'm not going to spend very much time on the occupation. If you came here to hear about the occupation, uh, you, can, you can leave quietly now. Because I think those folks have had more than enough time in the limelight. And I think Malheur is an incredibly amazing place. It's a magical place. And it's got an incredible story. And that story has continued to, to today. And it continued during the wildlife refuge occupation. And these folks came in and I think tried to hijack that story for their own very, very narrow political agenda. Uh, tonight, they're in jail, but this, le this, agenda, this legacy that began over 100 years ago is continuing. So that's what I want to spend my night on. I want to try and restore the real story of Malheur and the real magic of Malheur. So Malheur is an incredible place. It is one of the most important places for birds in the United States. And so I'm going to start with the birds because I know all you are, are here for the birds as well. Uh, but it's got a real human story, too, and we're going to spend some time on that. Uh, but uh, when you think of the Pacific Flyway, when you think of uh, migratory birds in the western United States, Malheur is arguably the most important wildlife refuge in the mid-flyway. And it's here today because people fought for it and continued to fight for it for over a century. And so just a little bit of, of information about Malheur. It's a place where uh, literally millions of waterfowl pass through every year and tens of thousands of water of um, shorebirds. Sandhill cranes in the foreground of this picture, 20% 20 uh, 20 of the sandhill cranes in Oregon and the largest population on any refuge in the western United States occurs at Malheur. Ross's geese and snow geese, 50% of the entire population of the world's, 50% of the entire world's population of Ross geese uh, pass through Malheur every year. So greater yellow legs, tens of thousands of shorebirds pass through Malheur every year. Another shorebird avocet. Waterfowl, at its peak, upwards of 50% of the waterfowl in the Western, fly, Western Pacific Flyway would pass through Malheur. And upwards of 180,000 waterfowl would be produced on Malheur Lake every year. Think about that number, upwards of 180,000 ducks every year on Malheur Lake. So absolutely incredible. As I mentioned, Santo Cranes, largest population of any refuge in the, United States, in the Western United States, and 20% of the world's population of white-faced ibises. <laughs> in fact, there's over 300 species of birds that use Malheur every year. And a lot of these pictures uh, were taken by Candace Larson, who's here tonight. Candace, raise your hand for a second, where we are. Uh, this is one of them. This is a burrowing owl. Uh, but 300 different species every year. And you can see in this picture why it is so important. Um, can people read this from the back? Is it visible from the back? OK, that's good to know. You know, it's in the center of the flyway. Millions and millions of birds pass through Oregon every year on their northward and southward migrations. And this incredible place with this uh, inland lake is critical to their survival, uh, absolutely critical. And in fact, we have a whole series of lakes that um, make up a complex called the Sonic Wetlands. And the Sonic Wetlands, that stands for uh, Southern Oregon, Northern, Northeastern California Wetlands. You have the Klamath Lake Refuges, Summer Lake, Lake Abert, and then Malheur over here. So 
you know, you can imagine all these birds passing through these desert areas on their migration, this incredibly strenuous journey that they make. Uh, and they get into this region here, uh, very dry. Um, these places are absolutely critical for making those migrations north and south. Without them, uh, many of our species wouldn't be able to survive out here. How many people in this room have been to Malheur? Most of you, not everybody. So Malheur is 180,000 acres, and the centerpiece is Malheur Lake. Um, and this, again, uh, provided habitat at its peak, uh, and we're going to talk about how it's declined in recent years and how we're going to recover it. At its peak, uh, produced 180,000 waterfowl a year. We have Mud Lake and Harney Lake here. Going down the Blitzen Valley, this is all part of the refuge uh, along here. Uh, and then Steens Mountain over here. Malheur has been declared a globally significant important bird area. Both Aud National Audubon Society and um, American Bird Conservancy uh, got it designated as a globally, globally important bird area because uh, how, of how critical it is to the survival of so many species. Uh, that's an internationally resignated, uh, uh, recognized de designation. Steens Mountain is a national important bird area, continental. Again, a, a really uh, rare designation. And uh, so you have these, these two areas right next to each other, literally backing up to each other for birds. Up here, this is the Sylvie's floodplain. This is ranch land. And part of the story of Malheur is the surrounding landscape. It's not just about the refuge tonight. It's about the surrounding landscape and the community as well. The floodplain up here uh, provides very important habitat for birds as well. And this is private land. Uh, Malheur Lake is fed by two, two rivers, uh, the Sylvius River and the Blitzen River. Uh, so you have it coming in from the north and you have it coming in from the south. Uh, the Blitzen comes off of Steens Mountain. It's from Snowpack. And so, uh, Malheur Lake, which, which is a giant lake, uh, only is typically sometimes just a few inches deep. Uh, sometimes it's just a few feet deep. Rarely gets over several feet deep. Uh, so you have this giant area with very shallow water. And just a different map that shows you sort of the outline of the, uh, the refuge. So you get the lakes up at the top. Uh, where the occupation occurred was right here. Uh, this is the headquarters. And that's where uh, the occupiers came in and took over the refuge. And again, as I said, this is the refuge headquarters right here. This is the building uh, that they, they used for a lot of their operations. And you can see the important bird area, the globally significant uh, bird area designations on the building. When the occupiers took over the refuge, they talked about how they wanted to give the land back to the original owners. <laughs> so these are the original owners. And we should all remember that we're sitting on land right now that had different original owners as well. It's not just Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so uh, the Burns Paiute tribe uh, were the original owners. Uh, they were there for upwards of uh, 6,000 years. Uh, they trace their history uh, in, in their legends back to before the Cascade Range. And uh, they've had a, uh, a challenging existence uh, since uh, Europeans came here and settled. Um, as I said, they've been in the Great Basin for more than 6,000 years. Uh, in 1872, uh, they created the Malheur Reservation under US, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, 1.5 million acre reservation for the Burns Paiute tribe, or for the Paiute tribe at that time. In 1879, the federal government seized the 1.5 million acres of Paiute land and moved the Paiutes to the Yakima Reservation in Washington. They were eventually allowed to return, but when they did, that's what they got back. This is the reservation in uh, 1879, and this is the reservation today, if you can see that little dot in the back of the room. Uh, so not a whole lot there. Uh, it took 90 years for the government to pay them for the land they lost, and when they did that, they paid the entire tribe $700,000. Uh, that worked out to $743 per person. Uh, the government didn't feel they needed to pay interest. If they had paid interest, it would have been about 21,000. Pre pretty bad deal either way. Today, the reservation is 760 acres. There are 400 enrolled members of the tribe, and about half of them live on the reservation right, side, right side, outside of Burns, above the, res above the uh, refuge. And uh, Charlotte Rodrigue, the Burns Paiute tribal chair, made it very clear when, this, when the refuge occupation occurred. Uh, this land is still our land, no matter who is living on it. 
Uh, she also made a comment that she was trying to figure out how um, she was going to accept the land back when the occupiers gave it to them. <laughs> of course, that wasn't their intention. Uh, the interesting thing, and we'll talk a little more about this in a few minutes, is that the original Malheur National Wildlife Refuge never was owned by ranchers. After the tribe was removed and came back, uh, that land was kept by the government. It was not occupied by ranchers. It was not sold. And so when Malheur became a national wildlife refuge, it had gone from tribal ownership to federal government ownership to wildlife refuge. I want to stop and talk about Harney County as well, because this is a story about people. And it's actually a story about people ultimately figuring out how to get along. Uh, and we have some very, very disparate interests of all the things we work on at Audubon. This is perhaps the most challenging landscape. It's the eighth largest county in the United States at 10,000 square miles, and there are 8,000 residents of that county. To give you an idea of how few people there are there, there are 56,000 birders that visit the refuge every year. <laughs> 5 .6, more than almost six times the number of people visit the refuge who live in the entire county. 75% uh, of the landscape is in public ownership. They've hit hard times. If you go back to the 1970s, they had some of the highest per capita income in the state. A lot of it was timber driven. But uh, with uh, the listing of, of various species uh, and better forest management practices, that, that timber industry went away to a large degree. Uh, federal government provides 12% of the jobs and about 20% of the income of those government jobs. In 2009, they had 17% unemployment. 800 jobs were timber related in the 1970s, almost all of those are gone. When you think about a county of 8,000 8, people, 7,000, 8,000 people, 800 jobs is a really, really big deal. And there are about 800 people working in ranching jobs today. So you can see, you know, it doesn't sound like a whole lot of people when you get the 800 number, when you realize it's about uh, one-tenth of the county, it's a big deal. In 2009, the region's last big industrial employer, Monaco Coach, left and laid off 100 people. Uh, I believe today the biggest employer in the city of Burns is Safeway. So it just gives you a sense of the kind of desperation that is occurring in this county. And when we work out there, and we work out there a lot, we hear a lot about that. And it is a very tough place. A lot of their kids are moving away because there aren't jobs and there aren't opportunities. And so part of the challenge there is how do you make this community whole again? And I'll say, you know, a lot of times I hear birders say, oh, you know, we'll just go there and spend money and, and we'll, we'll, we'll support their economy. And, and we should, that's great. That's a really important part of it. The hotel industry, the restaurant industry, uh, we can contribute an incredible amount. And that's part of the message tonight is go to Harney County and spend your money. But we also, I think, need to be honest as well because tourism is not the same as the jobs they've lost and uh, the challenges are, are real and it's, it's different to work in a hotel room than it is out in the forest. And so uh, it's, it's a cultural challenge and it's an economic challenge and it will be even with the tourism industry. So let me start at uh, the beginning for Audubon. Um, we'll move to Audubon. As I mentioned, uh, you know, we started talking about Gary tonight, uh, a great photographer. Uh, this was our founder, also a great photographer. This is William Finley. And you know, it's, who, who here's heard of William Finley? I think William Finley should be up there in the pantheon of 20th century naturalists along with John Burroughs and John Muir. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that William Finley belongs up there. An incredible naturalist uh, who founded Portland Audubon, then Oregon Audubon, in 1902. And uh, this is Finley with his condor, the general. Uh, and he rescued this bird uh, from a fire in California, and he traveled with it. There's great early pictures of all the Audubon events with the, con with the condor hanging out you know, at the picnics and the birding trips. And this, by the way, is a species that we're committed to restoring. And uh, you know, I'd love for everybody to get involved. Uh, you know, I think honoring these people, whether it's William Finley and his legacy or Gary and his, his, his legacy, I think the message is get involved, uh, help, help make change. William Finley uh, founded Audubon in 1902. Before he was done, I want to read you a list of, of the places he wound up protecting. Uh, we should all have such careers. He protected three arch rocks. He protected Flattery Wildlife Refuge on the uh, Washington coast, uh, 900 islands and reefs. Uh, Copalis, 
Quillut, uh, Quillut um, needles uh, also on the coast, Klamath National Wildlife Refuge, uh, Malheur National Wildlife, the Umatilla, the Suislisla, the Umpqua, the Siskiyou, and the Wawa, the Deschutes, and the Fremont National Forests. Uh, he was the one that advocated for all of those places to be protected. Uh, so when you look across Oregon, it was his leadership and the advocacy of Oregon Audubon at that time that set those places aside. When he founded Portland Audubon, Oregon Audubon, uh, it was really to do two things. The first was to pass the Model Bird Act, uh, to pass the first uh, laws to protect non-game birds in the state of Oregon. Uh, he accomplished that within a year. And the second was to protect the first wildlife refuges in the western United States, and he would have tremendous success within that first decade. He was a character. He uh, wanted to bring attention to the women's hat trade, and I'll, I'll hold that story for a second, actually. Let me, uh, let me jump into these slides here. What was he concerned about? In early 1900s, amazing slaughter of birds for sport, uh, for the restaurant industry, just wanton slaughter. Passenger pigeon, the most prolific bird on the planet, was destroyed within a matter of a couple of decades in the late 1800s, uh, just eliminated uh, a, a slaughter on the scale of the killing of the buffalo in the eastern United States. Uh, out here and in the southern United States, we had uh, massive slaughter for the bird trade, for the, uh, for the hat trade, for the millinery trade. Uh, they would kill egrets and herons and pretty much anything that moved uh, for their feathers. And this is just a picture uh, taken in the Klamath. Uh, those are all birds being hunted for their feathers. Uh, here you can see similar uh, Oregon Historical Society slides. And that's what those birds became. And so Finley wanted to bring attention to this. He did it in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of his most interesting ways was that he would go up to women on the street and he would rip the feathers off their hats <laughs> and create a scene. So activism goes back to our earliest days. <laughs> but mostly he did it through his photography. And he was famous for being willing to go anywhere and do anything to get a picture of a bird. And he actually talked about feeling like he became an amphibian when he was on the beaches. Uh, he would just stay for days, sometimes weeks. Uh, he would climb up into the trees. He would go into the wetlands um, and get these incredible photographs. And he would go with his friend Herman Bowman. This is Three Arch Rocks, uh, which he was the first refuge he was able to protect working with Roosevelt. He camped out with the rocks in the background with uh, Bowman in the front and Finley in the back with the plate. And if you look closely, uh, you might not be able to see this in the back. This is Finley and Bowman climbing up Three Arch Rocks. They take a little dory out there, they'd climb up and they would get pictures of the MERS and, and various other species. They didn't use ropes back then, they just climbed. And they carried giant, giant cameras. And this gives you a sense of how big the cameras were, he's sitting in a great blue heron nest. Uh, they would go 60, 70 feet up a tree and, and sit there and photograph them. And he went out to eastern Oregon and took pictures of the Klamath and the Malheur. And I wanted to show you a few pictures. I'll go through them pretty quickly. I could spend all night on them, but uh, I pretty, probably don't want that. But this, these are taken at Klamath and Malheur. And what I want you to notice in some of these pictures is the vegetation, the incredible vegetation uh, that's there, because this is also part of the story, because it disappears. And they would go into these wetlands, sometimes for weeks, and uh, get incredible pictures, just sit there and wait for birds to show up and, and take these pictures, and sleep out. Again, notice this amazing vegetation in the background. This is what the waterfowl need to nest. Why was Malheur so prolific? Why did it produce 180,000 waterfowl a year? because it had these incredible mats of, of vegetation, of grass, and they would nest in these basically floating islands. This is where they would nest. And this is where they would have picnics. And there's nothing like this done before. No one had taken these kinds of pictures. They were still taking pictures of dead birds that they were you know, arranging in awkward positions, sort of follow up from John James Audubon of uh, you know, drawn from life. Well, drawn from life after they were killed. And so, you know, he was out there getting these pictures that had never been seen before of birds, in, literally eggs hatching and getting uh, videos of uh, film of this as well. And they would make these glass slides and they would hand color them. They were black and white, but they would hand paint them. So the color you're seeing is hand painting. And they documented all of what was going on there, the terns and pintail ducks, the nests. Uh, and it was just this incredibly uh, prolific pla place. This is from 1914, Dallas Moore Sharp, another great naturalist. Uh, the sedges were full of birds, the water's full of, of birds. 
avocets, stilts, willets, killdeer, coots, phalaropes, rails, tool wrens, yellow-headed blackbirds, etc. 143 square miles of them, clouds of them, acres of them, miles of them. Uh, that's what they found when they got there. But they also didn't find some things as well. They didn't find any egrets because in the 1890s, feather hunters, plume hunters came and literally killed virtually every egret on Malheur National Wildlife, virtually every single one of them. They found two. They camped out for something like six weeks looking for egrets, and they found two. And they documented the slaughter. This is a grebe dead in front of its nest. And again, people hadn't seen this. What they'd seen were feathers on hats. They hadn't seen birds dead in the water next to their nests after they'd been plucked. And so these were really powerful images. Who's here heard of the Great Loop Tour that Teddy Roosevelt took? The Great Loop? Everyone should have heard of the Great Loop Tour. <laughs> and now you will have. <laughs> so I got some statistics here. So in 1903, Teddy Roosevelt decided that he wanted to tour these incredible places that he'd heard about. Uh, he had just uh, protected the first uh, wildlife refuge down in Florida, Pelican Island, and he wanted to see these incredible places he was hearing about in the West. And so he decided that he was going to tour the country by train. And he took a 60-day vacation, and he told the media to leave him alone. <laughs> and he headed out. Uh, he went 14,000 miles by train uh, in 60 days. And um, he uh, gave 250 stump speeches along the way. Once a politician, always a politician. He also really uh, focused on the natural history of the continent. And the results of that trip are, are unreal. Uh, he took some interesting people with him as well. He took John, Bur John Burroughs with him, the great naturalist John Burroughs, uh, for the first leg of the trip out to Yellowstone and went camping with Burroughs there. And while he was in Yellowstone, he, he became convinced that that needed to be protected. And he talked about it as a great democratic experiment, that they, they, they were protecting these landscapes. I have a quote, I'm not going to find it in the book, um, but amazing quotes about the importance of protecting these places. Actually, actually I will. I'll read it to you because I think it's, it's worth hearing. Because this is the uh, philosophy he brought, and it's one that we should remember today. The Yellowstone Park is something unique in this world. As far as I know, nowhere else in, the civil, in any civilized country is there to be found such a tract of veritable wonderland, made accessible for all visitors, where at the same time, not only the scenery of that wilderness, but also the wild creatures of the park are scrupulously preserved as they, ha as they have been here. And he made speeches like this at all these stops along the way. And it was a heck of a trip. So he spent uh, some time in Yellowstone with Burroughs, Burroughs, by the way, was really avidly anti-hunting, and he kept telling Teddy Roosevelt on this trip that he needed to grow up. He'd ask him when he was going to outgrow his hunting. So we had an animal rights activist in 1903 on the, on the train. Uh, he went to New Mexico, and um, uh, the Rough Riders there tried to give him a, 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 a live bear they had captured. Um, I don't know if that actually happened or not, but uh, uh, apparently the Rough Riders tried to do that. Uh, he lectured uh, folks in various cities that they need to plant more trees. And he uh, went to the, uh, the, uh, the Redwood Forest. Uh, when he got to the Redwoods, he um, uh, was appalled because they had named all the trees. They had, put, uh, you know, they had put names on the trees. And he thought that was just totally tacky. He required them to take it down. They wanted to name a tree after him. His condition was they take down the tacky signs. At the Grand Canyon, he was appalled uh, that he didn't, he could only name a hundred of the plants on the rim. This place he'd never been before, but he was able to name almost all 300 of the birds that were there. We should have a president like this again someday. <laughs> and this is him with Burroughs and uh, at the Redwoods, and then uh, he visited Yosemite with, with John Muir. Spent uh, a bunch of time camped out in the Yosemite with, um, with John Muir. And he came to Portland, and there he met Finley. And Finley, uh, the story goes, and I'm not sure it's true, but I'm, I'm going to tell it anyways because I think it's a great story. And if it's not true, it should become part of the myth anyways. That, you know, people, there were 50,000 people meeting him in these places, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people. And he got off the train in Portland, and you can imagine the bandstand uh, and the parade, and shouted, get me Finley. And apparently went off with Finley to look at photographs. 
And if you read the history of Roosevelt in Portland, that actually fits pretty well. He was in a bad mood when he was here, and he regularly stood up audiences. He showed up early, gave speeches to three people, and then left before the rest of them showed up. <laughs> he also had a book that he was reading that got lost, and he was mad, so he left the hotel that was, he was staying at and went back to the train and <laughs> left town. Um, so it, it fits with what was happening there, so, I, so I'll, I'll believe it's true. He uh, met with, met with uh, Finley and... Uh, Finley knew he was really partial to puffins, so showed him puffins. The result of that trip was the establishment of Three Arch Rocks and a request to Finley to come visit him in Washington, uh, D.C. And Finley eventually made that trip and brought more photographs. And I'll just read you one more quote here. I won't read you too many tonight. but. Um, this talks about basically after Finley uh, went there and, and showed these photographs of these birds. This quote is uh, from Dallas Ware Sharp as well. Uh, and he's talking about the birds here. The birds did not see the pictures of their rainy seascaped home spread in the high excitement over a table in the White House, nor watch the eager man, all teeth and eyes and pounding fists, wanging about and bellowing, bully, 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 just like the bull sea lion. But Finley did. They did not see him study the pictures and vow, we'll make a sanctuary out of three arch rocks, but Finley did. So that was the first refuge. Finley later came back and advocated for Malheur and Klamath. And I love this picture. Um, the caption, which you can't read, uh, but what it says is, a modern prairie schooner used for a 2,000 mile trip across Oregon, Herman Bowman and William Finley driving, Ben to Burns, 1908. And right here, it says, the results of this trip created the Malheur Wildlife Reservation. So pretty amazing. In 1908, Malheur and Klamath were both established within a matter of months of each other. And uh, this is the executive order. Um, basically, I declare it so order uh, that Roosevelt made, declaring Malheur as established as a preserve and breeding ground for native birds to preserve the habitat values of the three lakes. Malheur, Mud, and Harney Lakes for migratory waterfowl, and especially the colonial nesting species. These were the largest refuges of their kind at the time. Most of the refuges he had established were a couple of thousand acres, 5,000 acres. This was 80,000 acres. And they were the first inland refuges. And again, they were not taken from the ranchers. They were taken from the Paiute. So I'll talk a little bit about you know, the challenges that have occurred over the last century, uh, because it hasn't been all tranquility at Malheur. And it's a very dynamic, complicated landscape. Some people uh, supported the refuge at times and didn't support it at other times. It was very, uh, in some cases, ranchers wanted the government to come in and buy land because they knew they could graze on the government land. And they were concerned about big California ranchers and agribusiness coming in and buying up large tracts and blocking them out. So a lot of the homesteaders, for example, were concerned about the big California businesses that were locking them out and supported Malheur being bought out. Uh, there were water battles, very typical of the Western United States. And this is 1920. What this is is the state of Oregon, some of the ranchers down there at the time decided they wanted more water and they wanted to move on to Malheur Lake. And so the state of Oregon decided, well, we'll run a referendum and we'll try and take Malheur back from the federal government. And this is a great sign, which is best for Oregon, this baby or this bird, the Malheur Bird Reserve, would take from Oregon 7,000 acres of its most valuable school lands, would prevent irrigation and reclamation of fertile lands, and would continue to shallow, uh, create shallow mosquito breeding ground swamps. They were concerned at that time about malaria, so that was a big deal. The people of Harney County asked Portland to play fair. So some of the same dynamics back then are at play as they are today. Uh, it didn't pass. There were cases that went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court repeatedly affirmed the right of the federal government to own these lands. And some of the militia claim that they don't have that right. Uh, they're citing the wrong part of the Constitution. The Constitution is very clear, and the Supreme Court has repeatedly validated this. Government absolutely has the right to own these lands, and they do. Um, and Malheur has been the test case in a couple of instances. So it's not just about refuges in general, it's about Malheur specifically. Highest court in the land has spoken very clearly. There were efforts in the 1940s to drain Malheur. Uh, some of the ranches closer to Steens Mountain started blocking the water to Malheur. Uh, and uh, William Finley intervened again and 
got the federal government to appropriate funds to buy the ranch uh, that eventually became the P Ranch. Those of you who've been to the southern part of Malheur, a lot of people don't go there. It's an incredible place. Uh, that was bought with funds that Finley solicited to add another, I believe, 70,000 acres to the refuge. So he played a huge role in, in the refuge that it, we have today, 180,000 acres. And there have been a variety of acquisitions, some of them completely voluntary, others uh, people feel less so. Uh, but the vast majority of the refuge was, was purchased at fair market and uh, is what it is today. I want to talk about one more person, and then I'm going to move up to the current times. Uh, this is Dave Marshall. Uh, who here in this room knows Dave? Dave's another sort of legendary Audubonner, and he was the first, um, he was a refuge biologist out at Malheur in the 1950s. He was the first endangered species biologist for uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He also was a um, avid supporter of creating new wildlife refuges and the Willamette Valley wildlife refuges that you know today. If you've been to the refuges in the valley, that was Dave who sought those out. When you go out to Harney County and you talk to a rancher, they will talk about Dave. As soon as you say you're from Audubon, they remember Dave with incredible fondness. They think he was an amazing guy and uh, they still talk about him today. He died a few years back. I don't think Georgia Marshall wasn't able to make it tonight, was she? Dave's, Dave's widow. Uh, she, she comes to a lot of these and she's still involved with Audubon. Dave was part of our organization for for better part of a century and um, Dave uh, encouraged me when I became conservation director to go out there and re-engage with them because he felt Audubon had become less engaged with Mal here over the years and Portland had lost contact with this incredible place and he, he very aggressively pushed me and said you need to go back out there and you need to reconnect with this place. This is part of our history and more importantly it's one of the most important places in the West and it needs attention and I think he saw that if we didn't give it attention things could go sideways very easily and that they were going sideways and in fact in his book that he wrote uh, a few years before he died he talked about how it brought him great sadness to go to Malheur and see the hard times that had fallen on um, that the bird population was not what he remembered in the 1950s it had declined dramatically but Dave was an incredible person and an incredible advocate and somebody who I think was a bridge between uh, people who didn't always agree and really always emphasized uh, that aspect as well as um, being a guy who led the charge to list birds like the marble merlet and the spotted owl that you also need to talk to people as well. And so let me move up to the present. The Wildlife Refuge Act um, was passed in the 1980s, late 1980s, and, or late 1990s, I'm sorry. And what it required was that every refuge in the United States by 2012 do a comprehensive conservation plan. And what the federal government was concerned about was that uh, the refuges were following their missions and that they had a plan to do that. And so by 2012, they had to develop a vision and goals and strategies in order to show that they were meeting the mission uh, that they were set aside for, in this case, to protect these birds. Uh, but every refuge in the country had to do it. And it's a big document that comes out of this. You know, uh, the government's really good at doing this kind of stuff. This is the document. This is what they look like. I'll be happy to loan it to anybody. <laughs> and so part of this was you have to do a compatibility analysis. If you're doing things on the refuge, for example, grazing or uh, uh, recreational activities, you have to show that those are compatible with the purpose of that wildlife refuge. Uh, and so this was a big deal because it was basically holding refuges accountable to their missions. And pretty much every wildlife refuge in the United States did the exact same process for this. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But before I do that, in 2005, some folks got together in Harney County and decided that they wanted to do things differently, that we'd had these conflicts, their economy was in the tank. How do we bring people together? And they formed something called the High Desert Partnership. And this was ranchers and conservationists. Uh, Bruce Taylor, if you know Bruce Taylor, who used to work for Defenders of Wildlife, uh, was int intimately involved in this. This gentleman, Chad Cargis, who was the Assistant Deputy Refuge Manager, was intimately involved in this. And you had Kearney County Commissioners and ranchers. And so they formed the High Desert Partnership with the goal that the mission is to enhance the ecological sustainability economic well-being and social vitality of our communities by using collaborative decision-making processes. That sounds pretty simple. It sounds good. Working cooperatively is almost a necessity in Harney County, Oregon, with the ninth largest county in the United States. Over 75% of the land is managed by the government agencies, and a good portion of the 7,100 7, residents are tied to the land. No-brainer, right? Wrong. 
this is a place of conflict. This is a place where all the battles inherent in the Western United States was writ large, and this is a place that was in trouble at that point, and where you had a lot of very angry people. This was a huge risk, and for the deputy refuge manager to be involved in this, and I think he was involved very quietly early on, uh, was really stepping out and doing something the government doesn't typically do. And they went to the refuge and to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they said, we want to do a different kind of process when you do your comprehensive conservation plan. We want to do a collaborative consensus-based process. Now, again, and that seems like a no-brainer, but this is what it really looks like typically when you do these processes. Agency decides what it wants to do. They go out and they ask the public what they want the agency to do. They release a draft environmental in, uh, impact statement for public comment that goes back to here and says what they want to do. The public comments again, and then they release a final EIS that looks like this, and then they get sued. <laughs> I could add another arrow too going down here. They put it on a shelf and it collects dust. Every single wildlife refuge in the United States followed this process except for Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, every single one. They agreed very hesitantly and they were terrified of this process. They felt that it was going to be expensive, it was going to be time consuming, it was going to be divisive, it would get nowhere and they would get sued in the end but it would take a lot longer to get there and uh, it would just waste resources and would probably exacerbate things. Um, but they finally were convinced to do it and they hired Oregon Consensus Project out of the governor's office and they brought a lot of groups together, uh, ranchers, Harney County commissioners, uh, environmental groups, state, local and uh, federal agencies, soil and water conservation districts, and they brought us together for three or four years and we met over and over and over again. And um, it's a pretty amazing process. Uh, and I don't say that, we're, we're involved in a lot of processes, a lot of consensus-based processes, a lot of them go nowhere, a lot of them are for show, they don't actually make change on the landscape. I would say on this one, this is the uh, most effective one I've been involved in. It's the most, the outcome of this was the most important, one of the most important projects from an ecological perspective in the Western United States. And I think it was also uh, one of the most important projects I've been involved in for actually building real consensus, true consensus, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second. Uh, some other environmental groups that were involved, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, Defenders of Wildlife, Ducks Unlimited, just a ton of different groups. And, uh, Oregon Natural Desert Association, the Wetlands Conservancy. So a lot of environmental groups at the table and they really stuck it out. Uh, and this is sort of the list. Uh, the Burns Paiute Tribe was there as well. And this is sort of a mission statement. And what, uh, you, you can't read it and I'm not gonna read it to you, I've read you enough tonight. But what it says really is we need to work together. That the only way we're gonna make any progress on this landscape that has ecologically failing and also economically failing is to find some common ground and try and figure out how to go forward together. And so that was the goal. And so we met tons and tons of times. Uh, I brought my kids out with me. And I did that for a reason. You know, we didn't do it on the phone. We actually drove out there and everybody made a real effort to do that because I think that FaceTime, that actually seeing each other, bringing your family, letting them see you of kids, that kind of thing, going out for a beer afterwards made a difference. And one of the things I would love to see Audubon do is actually put a permanent staff person out there. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, I know there's some folks from there here tonight, have made that investment and I think it's an incredibly valuable thing. If we're gonna ask these landscapes to make changes, we should be part of these landscapes when we do it. Uh, we all toured the refuge for a week together and it was interesting to me because we would go around the refuge and we would visit places and uh, they would say, we should be managing it for X, but we're managing it for ducks because Malheur Lake is dead. And so we're managing uh, the Blitzen River Valley for, for ducks, to, for duck production. It's not really the best use, but, but we need to get ducks out of this place. And then we go somewhere else and they say, well, we're managing this place for ducks. And the story kept repeating and finally, we, we were sitting up here about the third or fourth day at the Buena Vista Overlook, and uh, Bruce Taylor, who I mentioned earlier, said to uh, the refuge manager, Tim Bodine, um, you know, basically, uh, are we ever going to talk about Malheur Lake? And Tim basically said, no, we're not. And the reason for that was the federal government felt that Malheur Lake was so um, basically degraded that it would never produce ducks again. It would just be controversial, it would cost a lot of money, it couldn't be fixed, and this group certainly could never agree on how to do it. It was hopeless. And so basically, we were wandering around this refuge, visiting places that were being managed deliberately for not the highest and best use, but to compensate for someplace else on the refuge that wasn't producing the way it should.
when we enter this process, this is what people thought was going to be the big issue. Uh, and you know, I knew tonight when we announced this, we would immediately get people that would want to talk about paying and grazing and cows. Uh, and this showed up on our Facebook page right away. I do hope the presentation will include mention in detail about the excessive presence on the refuge of large numbers of another invasive and destructive species, domestic cattle, and the fact that ranchers annually bail and haul away significant amounts of hay. Uh, this is a nice version of uh, <laughs> this issue. You know, cattle on public lands is one of the hot button issues of the Western United States. And that's the biggest fear the federal government has. We could never get through this process without going to war over cattle. Because there are cattle grazing on the refuge, and there have been since the beginning, pretty much. And they also allow the hay to be removed from the refuge as well. And so everybody expected that we would spend our time fighting about this and that we would get nowhere. And frankly, we expected that too. Uh, and th there's reason to do that. There is reason to uh, want cows off of public lands, and there's a great amount of science about this, and there's a lot of debate about it. There are some folks that feel very adamantly that uh, because there are so many invasive species, you need grazing to some degree as a tool. Uh, there are others that just feel that uh, cows don't belong on public lands, they degrade the water quality, uh, and that they introduce uh, invasive species, that they're, they're basically pooping out the seeds that perpetuate this cycle, that they're trampling eggs and nests. Uh, it's a very, very divisive issue. Uh, and you know, speaking for Audubon, we are concerned about grazing on public lands, absolutely. We think it's a very big issue and a very uh, important issue to address, and there should be significantly less of it. Uh, we went into this process with that attitude, and I believe it's still today. But that's not what we wound, and I just put this one in because I think there's some people that will just say that the only good cow is a dead cow. And this is one of those issues where, as a conservationist, you get called up and people literally just scream obscenities into the phone at you until you hang up uh, if you say anything other than the only good cow is a dead cow. Um, and I got that in, during this process from some, a lot of folks, too. So what were the issues that were identified in this process? Overgrazing, channelization of the Blitzen River, uh, loss of the floodplain, that river that runs to the north uh, coming out of the Steens Mountain uh, is very heavily channelized. It's not attached to its floodplain anymore. Invasive plant species, lack of scientific data, funding, alienation from the local community. And this one, carp. I don't know if you can all can see them. These are carp. This is a duck. So carp are an amazing animal. They were introduced to Malheur as they were across the state and across the country in the 1940s. They proliferated. They can be absolutely huge. They are like the super animal. You know, the only thing we're going to have left someday are going to be carp, starlings, and cockroaches. So we should all <laughs> just... They're, they get into almost anything. Uh, they can burrow into the mud. You can drain the lake. They dig down into the mud. They wait till the lake fills up a year later, and they pop back out. Uh, they lay millions of eggs. They are just absolutely prolific, and they're almost impossible to get out. And um, they, are, they dominate in Malheur Lake. And I showed you those pictures of the grasses that were so essential to duck breeding. Um, this is still. This is coming out of the uh, Sylvie's River, or as you, or, uh, out of the, uh, the Blitzen River, as, as you approach Malheur Lake. You're getting closer to Malheur Lake, and that's what it looks like today. What they do is they root around in the vegetation, they eat it, they destroy it, they uh, stir up the bottom of the, the lake, and they basically turn it into a black, murky water that is absolutely good for nothing except for carp. Some birds will eat them. Occasionally, an otter will try to eat one. This picture was taken by Candace. This gives you an idea of how big they get. This is, this is a real carp. And what we gradually realized was that we had a bigger common enemy uh, that we all could agree upon uh, than the battle we were potentially going to have over cows. Um, that if we didn't deal with the carp, nothing else would matter. We can kick the cows off tomorrow. We can do everything else on that list tomorrow, and if we don't get rid of the carp, it won't really matter that much. That's the bottom line. And to give you a sense of how big of a deal it is, Malheur Lake produced 180,000 ducks at its peak. It produces less than 10,000 today. So it's dramatic. That's our refuge biologist, Linda, uh, with the carp. Um, 
So they, no one has ever tried to do a carp eradication project of this scale. It's never been done before. How do you get rid of carp from this massive, massive lake uh, and this species that's so hard and so hardy to uh, get rid of? Well, they assembled experts from all over the world. Uh, and Esther Lev is here from the Wetlands Conservancy. Uh, Esther, raise your hand for a sec. Esther was one of the scientists. She's not a carp biologist, but she was one of the lead scientists that worked on this and just did an incredible job of injecting real science into this process and bringing in incredible people to advise the stakeholders. What we figured out was that if you can get carp down to less than 100 pounds an acre, you actually get the grasses to come back and you get the productivity. Uh, the current situation is 500 to 700 pounds an acre. You don't have to get rid of them all, but you have to get rid of a lot. This is the highest density of carp ever found anywhere. So uh, we have a big problem there. And it's literally, this massive lake is roiling with carp. I mean, And so we developed a carp plan. And a uh, very, very complex, sophisticated plan. Everybody thought that, you know, what, what are you going to do about the carp? Well, you just put rotin out in the lake and you poison them. No, that's not where we're going. Um, trying different things. And it's very sophisticated. Uh, first of all, figuring out where they are at. Uh, they radio tag a carp. They call it the Judas carp. And then they track it. And the carp congregate, so we can sort of track where they go and what they do, where they hang out, and, uh, and then you can target them more easily. So they also did a lot of mapping of the lake bed to understand you know, where the deep spots were and so on and so forth. They mapped the access points, because you can get them on the lake, they still can come back in. So they did some very sophisticated mapping of where they are in the system, and you go and you put in fish screens, and you make sure that those stay in place, and you fare them year after year, so the carp can't re-enter the system, or at least can't enter in large numbers. These are robo carp, car, car, carp. <laughs> summer and winter. This one has little you know, uh, mag tires that can actually go across the ice so it can track the carp uh, all season so we know what they're doing in the winter. This is the government at work. <laughs> I was talking to someone at the Fish and Wildlife Service during the occupation and I said, what's it like working in the FBI? He said, I've never met anyone who actually gets to control satellites from their suitcase. <laughs> and I immediately thought of robo carp. <laughs> Uh, fish screens, you know, ma ma uh, uh, manual sort of devices to block carp, um, control the water. Uh, this is an island that was built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. How many of you are familiar with East Sand Island and their killing of cormorants? Uh, something that we're also fighting. The other thing they're doing out there is they're relocating terns. They're scaring the world's largest tern colonies there, and they're scaring them off. Terns will relocate if you put uh, good habitat out, which is basically an inaccessible island, and you uh, put fake turns on it and you play recordings, they will show up and they will nest. The Army Corps built this island in the middle of Malheur Lake. It's a perfectly round island. It looks like an alien landing pad. And uh, they've attracted uh, turns there. And so, you know, attracting more fish-eating birds is part of the strategy. I really like the idea of like a filter fish factory. Um, <laughs> I'm Jewish. I, I, was, I was raised on gefilte fish. I just love the image of Hasidic Jews wandering around Harney County. <laughs> they have not taken me up on that, that recommendation yet. But hey, we're being innovative. You know. uh, the big idea that's coming is um, to uh, fish them out and so uh, turn them into fertilizer. And so they're working with the local folks to uh, basically do some very, very intensive fishing. Uh, it's now starting to happen. And um, uh, turn them into fertilizer. And so it will help the local economy, can drive local business, uh, help the agriculture, and get them out of the lake. And this is probably the best bet for really sort of the most aggressive removal. And what about the cows? Feed them carp. Feed them carp. <laughs> I'll pass that on. Cows are still there. Uh, we made some incremental progress on the cows. Uh, we did not get them off the refuge. Personally, I do not believe that we could have gotten them off the refuge from the, in this process. I believe that if we had fought for that, we would have gotten nothing else. It would have, the process would have tanked. They would have gone forward with cows on the refuge anyways. We would have sued. And candidly, I don't think we would have won because I think there's enough uh, information out there on both sides. I think we're more right than they are. But I do not think in, in, in the litigation we would have necessarily won in this case. And I think even if we did, it would have been a long battle and we would have gotten very much. But we did make some incremental progress, and it's really important incremental progress. We got them off of significant uh, portions of the refuge that are ecologically sensitive. We got the refuge to commit to a much more aggressive fencing program. We got them to do 
a lot more in terms of science and adaptive management, something that Esther's uh, leading the charge on. Uh, and one of the big deals about the CCP is refuges, Fish and Wildlife Service, tends to keep everything internal. They turned a lot of the control over to external folks. Um, I've never seen a public agency do it the way they did before in terms of engaging public uh, groups and, and bringing them in and letting them have a real stake and real control and input. So we're going to do adaptive management. We're going to look at where they're achieving their ecological goals and where they're not and adapt where the cows are at based on that. Uh, that's been slow coming. It's really politically charged, but we're continuing to have that conversation. And so, you know, we didn't get to where some people thought we should have. We may not have gotten as far as some people would have liked, but I think we are actually making real progress and I think we're gonna have a much more ecologically healthy refuge with cows. And I think the next time we do a CCP in 15 years, this is a 15 year plan, I think we'll have much better information and make better decisions then as well, and make better interim decisions. So I think we're on the right path forward. And I'll tell you, I, I knew we were making some progress because right after we finished this plan, there were the massive forest, or the massive uh, fires out on the range, massive range fires the following year. Uh, literally, the entire area around Mal here burned, and I got a call from the refuge manager, and he said, I'm bringing the cows onto the refuge. I want you to know, I want to be completely transparent. Literally, the ranches around us are burning up, and as a matter of just good faith with the community, we're allowing them to bring their cows onto our refuge. And he said, I hope Audubon and Onda and other groups will not protest that because we have an emergency here, and we promise you we'll get them off the refuge very quickly. And um, immediately, Greg Walden went on the radio and said, Great, thank you, Fish and Wildlife Service. Take the next step and make it permanent. <laughs> it was Harney County commissioners that called Greg Walden and said, no, no, we, we made a commitment and we appreciate what they're doing. And we're gonna be there until the fire's are over and then we're leaving. And that was what the ranchers told him. So I think it tells you how far we came. Uh, the Blitzen River floodplain, that's another issue. I'm gonna do it for time. Okay, I'll, I'll move you through it. Uh, Blitzen River floodplain. Not enough science there, not enough money. That got postponed to the next 15 year process. We're gonna do the science on figuring out can we reconnect this river to its floodplain. I hope we do, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done between here and there. We're not gonna spend the bulk of our resources there. It's gonna be on, on CARP. But next time we come around in 15 years, we're gonna address this. There's another picture of it, uh, another Candace picture. Uh, one of the big things that came out of this, and again, I, I, I attribute this to Esther, um, she led the charge on this, was the ranchers will tell you, and anybody who's been there that knows when you come down the Sylvies River from the north, um, and I, I know I've reversed them a few times in this talk, so I, I apologize if I confused you, what you'll see is fields like this full of birds. Um, these are private ranch lands, and they're there because there's habitat there for them, and some of the best birding down there uh, candidly does occur off refuge. Great birding on refuge, great birding off refuge. And so this area is incredibly important for birds as well. And the reason it works is because they do flood irrigation. Now flood irrigation, basically letting the rivers flood into the fields, oftentimes is problematic. The refuge bought the Pea Ranch back in the 1940s specifically to make sure that water got to the lake from the north, uh, from the south, from Steens Mountain. But uh, up here, it actually helps with the habitat. And so this is another thing we agreed upon. It wasn't part of the official refuge plan, but that we should work with the ranchers to make sure this is done efficiently, effectively, uh, but not necessarily convert to sprinkler systems here. And that's another place where we found common ground. So this became an on-refuge and off-refuge plan. You know, I went back to Audubon, and uh, Lynn Herring's here, who's been with us for, uh, I don't know what, 40 years? And Deanna Mueller Crispin, both members of our conservation committee, uh, who have been here, uh, who have, uh, these are the folks that fought for the spotted owl and the marble merlet and uh, led the charge when Audubon was all volunteers and are still engaged, uh, done amazing work. Uh, but I think they'll remember me coming back and saying, look, I'm gonna surprise you a little bit here. It's not about cows. What I think we can do on this plan is basically we can deal with the carp. And if we deal with the carp in the next 15 years and we deal with nothing else, we've done something phenomenal. And we can deal with the Sylvie's River floodplain. And if we do that, we'll have done something pretty phenomenal. And we can make some incremental progress on the cows. We're not giving anything up. We're getting something significant. We're not getting as far as some people would like, but we're gonna make some progress, and we're gonna make some progress on the Sylvie's, on the uh, Blitzen River floodplain. I think that's a pretty good deal. And, and they agreed, and so we signed off, and so did every single other member of this committee. The Paiutes, the Harney County Commission, the ranchers, uh, the local agencies, uh, the other conservation groups every single one. And the reason I put this slide up here 
is because I said at the beginning, this is a real consensus project in my mind. To me, a consensus-based project and collaboration isn't about agreeing on everything and setting aside your principles. I don't think we set aside any principles. I think we made two to them. I think everybody did. But I think we learned a lot from each other. We reprioritized based on what we'd learned, the information we gained. And we just agreed to move together on the things we could move together on. And we agreed to not to let a lot of the things that we didn't agree on divide us. We would be respectful about dealing with those. And at the height of the adoption process on this plan, we wound up suing uh, a developer that wanted to put windmills on Steens Mountain. Uh, another important bird area, I think you know, if you had to pick a bad place to put windmills in Oregon, Steens Mountain comes right after Crater Lake and Mount Hood. Uh, they would have been right here. This is looking from the Elwar Desert. Uh, you would have seen them from uh, the Kiger Gorge right over here. We negotiated for several years with Onda working with us on this. Um, ton of credit to Onda. They've done an amazing job. We could not come to consensus, so we found ourselves having to sue right as we were about to adopt the Malheur CCP. And I, I said to the Conservation Committee, I think we can get through this. I think we can disagree respectfully and move forward collaboratively. And I caught up the county commissioners and I told them directly that we were doing this and they expressed they're disappointed. And a week later, I went down to Harney County and Mucky Mucks from the US Fish and Wildlife Service were coming in to congratulate us all on this great collaborative effort, the only one of its kind uh, that had been done in the entire country. And uh, I was looking at Dan Nichols, this guy. I come up to about his chest. He usually wears a cowboy hat, talks like a cowboy, walks like a cowboy, he is a cowboy. And he, there's no one more hardcore in terms of supporting Harney County. And uh, he's a very conservative guy, but he's been an incredible leader on this. And he always, when he's, when he's upset, he sits there and he sort of rubs his hands together. <laughs> and we were going around the room and each one of us was giving sort of our glowing report to these mucky mucks from the US Fish and Wildlife Service about this great collaborative process. And I was sort of holding my breath with Dan. And you get to Dan and he looks across the table directly at me. And he says, well, we've been tested. We've been sorely tested. <laughs> but we're also doing something special here. And I believe that this is the path forward. And despite this test, I'm going to redouble my commitment to moving forward because maybe the next time when we have a Steens Mountain, we'll be more creative and more trusting and we'll find a solution to that too. And so even though I'm being tested here today, I'm committed to moving forward. And it was a pretty amazing moment. Uh, we're also being tested on sage grouse as well, and there's another place where we don't always agree. So I'll spend a few minutes on the, um, the occupation, and then I'll finish up. I'm not gonna show any pictures of the occupiers again. They've had more than enough time. You know, I think the thing to really take away from this is that there is a movement in this country to reverse public lands, to turn public lands back over to private control. Uh, it's, a, it's a real toxic brew of different people and different groups that are not, uh, that have a variety of grievances. Uh, some of those grievances have nothing to do with the land. Uh, there's a lot of white supremacists in this movement and they were writ large in Malheur. Many of the people at Malheur were not ranchers. Almost none of them were from Oregon. Some of them were from the East Coast. Um, it was amazing how many of them, if you tracked it closely, got up and said, I didn't know anything about ranching or Malheur until I got here, and, uh, but now I'm firmly convinced. Now you think you would look into that before you joined an armed occupation. <laughs> this is just an example. This is a car that was down there. I took this picture when I was down there. US government wants you to be microchipped and mind controlled. Google torture America. Uh, spread the word, you may be next. I mean, this is, this is the mentality that was, was writ large down there. Uh, they did a lot of damage. They uh, uh, did a lot of damage to the refuge. Uh, it'll take weeks to finish dealing with that. I've talked to the refuge manager recently and he, what he told me was uh, they need to go in there and do the assessments. They need to bring in their archeological crews because they dug up uh, areas that are archeologically sensitive. And then they need to um, uh, do some assessments and, and repairs before they let people back on. It could be a number of weeks. Uh, they dug latrines, they built roads, they took down fences. They you know, just basically trashed the place. You know, I, I want to convey two things here tonight. One is we need to support Malheur, the other is we need to support public lands. And so, you know, I don't think it's a very big movement, but I think it's a very loud movement. And I think we need to continually reaffirm the value of these places and the commitments that we have to them at Malheur and across the strait and across the country. And I hope you all be involved in that. 
Uh, we did have a rally in, in Portland. Jar Jarvis Kennedy came out uh, and spoke at that from the Paiute tribe. Uh, and I think he brought up some really interesting issues. You know, what if it was a bunch of natives that went out there and overtook that? Would they let us come into town and get resupplied? They just need to get the hell out of here. We don't want them here. Linda Neal, she's, she lives locally, but she also has a homestead out in Harney County. She spoke as well, and she spoke very, very powerfully about the collaborative work and how that was really the story of Malheur. And I would say, you know, uh, people in Harney County were watching this too, and, um, you know, these signs made a really big difference. I heard from a lot of people in Harney County uh, that seeing that kind of thing, uh, because those people stood up to the occupiers, and, um, you know, I think it was incredibly powerful to watch this community that has some grievances, has a variety of opinions about the refuge, about the government, say no to these kinds of tactics. We can agree to disagree, but we need to do it respectfully, not at the point of a gun. Some people asked why Audubon didn't go to Malheur, and I probably may have heard from some people in this room, because I know a lot of people wanted to go there and confront the occupiers. And, and honestly, you know, as an activist, I wanted to go there and confront the occupiers. You know, we have, we have this incredible connection to this place. Uh, the headquarters that they took over have monuments to Finley and Dave Marshall and a pond named after Dave Marshall. I mean, we feel very connected to this place, and it was really uh, fundamentally offensive to see this happening. We chose not to go, and the reason was uh, we thought it was much more powerful that the county, that these people locally, with all of their challenges, were willing to stand up and say no. And they said, you know, when we talk to people there, it's not helpful for you to come at this time. Uh, we don't need more people flooding in. Don't add to the Bundy Circus. Don't become another circus act. Don't dignify them that way. But support us from afar. And during this entire process, you know, we have our own voice. Um, that's what they wanted to put out there. And we wanted to be respectful of that and supportive at the same time. And so they said, get the word out about the collaborative work. Do that. And even during the height of the occupation, we were meeting in various places. Esther was at meetings down in Salem. We had meetings in Prineville. Harney County commissioners, ranchers, uh, coming across refuge staff to meet quietly and plan out how we're going to move forward when this is over, how we're going to move forward together. And uh, at the height of the uh, occupation, January 26th, the work that we've been doing for a couple of years was rewarded uh, with a $6 million grant from OWEB, uh, basically grants that are given out for landscape scale collaborative efforts. So a huge amount of money flowing into this project. Uh, again, Esther was one of the people that worked incredibly hard on this um, and a lot of other people as well. And you know, at the height of the occupation, there were ranchers, Harney County commissioners and environmentalists and refuge staff in Salem testifying about this and how important it was. So it just shows you, you know, even at the worst of times, people did stick together. And I know some people say, well, you know, there was all this, they got all this publicity, um, you know, that's just noise and eventually it will just be history, it will just be something in the past, this is the future. And by the way, this is for Audit Off Refuge, the area that this grant serves, this is the refuge here. This is the private lands north on the Sylvie's floodplain, so this is the refuge uh, and private lands where this money's going. So, you know, looking forward, uh, this is Candace with an eagle. Our commitment, uh, we, we've redoubled our commitment and so have a lot of other groups. Participating in the High Desert Partnership, uh, Harney Basin Wetlands Initiative, Malheur CCP, that's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of planning, uh, but it keeps us together and uh, we're actually, of all the projects I've ever worked on, this one hit the ground faster and more aggressively than any project I've ever seen with the federal government. People were doing work before the government even signed off on it and they continue to this day. Uh, so I think we're gonna get there. Candace and Joe Liebezite, who works for us as well, does our science and some of our advocacy, have developed the bird monitoring protocols for Mal here so that we make sure we're actually achieving the things we want to achieve. We provide a seasonal biologist. Thanks to Dave Marshall's family, Georgia Marshall, we're able to do that every year and send Candace out there for 10 weeks. And we're hoping we may actually extend that. As I said, I'd love to put a full-time person out there permanently. Uh, helping to develop expanded volunteer program. Uh, over 1,000 people signed up to volunteer through Audubon, another 1,000 signed up through ONDA, and then several hundred more through other groups to go out there and participate with the refuge. And, you know, I'd like to see this be more of a broader effort. I don't want to have a one-off where we all go out there, we clean up the mess that was made, and then we go home and we forget about it. I think if we really want to support what they're doing and support Harney County, it needs to be permanent. 
and we need to be sending crews out there on an ongoing basis, almost a cultural exchange, not to work just with the refuge, but to work with the Paiute and to work with the local community. And we need people to do you know, things like fixing fences and taking down fences and digging trenches and whatever. Uh, and then we need people uh, also who have professional skills as well. And part of the Leharney County partnership that I talked about is not just ecology, it's economic and it's social as well. And so there's a real desire to bring in resources. And I think we have an opportunity now to turn something that was very negative into something positive. And then finally, advocating for Malheur. We've talked for a couple of years uh, about a Malheur Restoration Act, because if we don't deliver on the ground, we're not, it doesn't matter. You know, collaboration is great, but if you don't accomplish anything, who really cares in the end? Um, we need some money to do it. This isn't a billion dollar project. It's not a hundred million dollar project. It's about 35 million over about 15 or 20 years to get all this stuff done. Not a huge amount of money. The government actually lowered the funding for Mal here once we started getting along and put the money elsewhere. You know, I think one of the lessons here is we need to nurture the places where we get along all the more so on conflicted landscapes. Uh, because as, as Dan Nichols said, if we can figure it out here, maybe we'll be more creative and more trusting and more aggressive about working it out elsewhere. And so what can you do? You can visit Harney County. I asked uh, Dan Nichols, you know, what would be helpful? He said, tell people to come here. We're open for business. We're going there in a couple of weeks for the John Sharp Bird Festival. Uh, Steve Robertson, our education director, Joe, uh, Micah, who I think is here tonight, myself will be leading that trip. Uh, I think Steve is going to go on that. Right, Steve? Right. Anyways, you know, we don't know if the refuge will be open. We think it will be, but we promise you really cool birds, really good time, and you'll see amazing stuff. So we're going out there for the John Sharp Festival in, in April. We'll have a lot more trips out there. Um, you can donate to the Malheur Restoration Fund. Uh, that's not through Audubon. Um, I can give people information about that if they're interested. Uh, and that money goes directly into the, um, the, the, the lake. It goes directly into the carp work and the uh, work on the um, surrounding landscape. I did have an address, but I don't have it at the moment. You can help us advocate for a Malheur Restoration Act, and um, you can advocate for public lands in general. And so, you know, the, the last thing I'll leave you with here tonight before I finish up is I really urge everybody to become an activist. Uh, join the Audubon activist list. Uh, join another group's activist list. Uh, we need a lot of voices. This is going to be a battle at Malheur and other places ongoing. Uh, we need to speak up for our public lands. Uh, and we also just need to build that kind of community. You know, the last thing I'll say too is just that uh, I, I'm, I think this is a great collaborative process. I think it is going to be the path forward. Uh, but I do think also there are places where you disagree as well. And so, you know, Audubon is a group uh, that always works collaboratively when it can. And we'll, we'll use other methods when we can't. Uh, but we're going to be respectful when we do it. We don't do it at the point of a gun. We don't do it the way the occupiers chose to make their points. And so I'll just end with a poem. This is Mal Here Before Dawn. It's by William Stafford. And in case people can't read it, I'll just read it. It's short. An owl sound wandered along the road with me. I didn't hear it. I breathed it into my ears. Little ones at first, the stars retired, leaving polished little circles on the sky for a while. Then the sun began to shout from below the horizon. Throngs of birds campaigned, their music a tent of sound. From across the pond, out in the mist, one drake made a V and said its name. Some vast animal of air began to rouse and then the reeds in, from the reeds and lean outward. Frogs discovered their national anthem again. I don't know a ditch. I didn't know a ditch could hold such joy. So magic a time it was that I was both brave and afraid. Some day like this might save the world. So thank you very much. <laughs>